I can guarantee that you'll have better FPS and less input delay at the end of today's video, as I'll be going over 50 ways to make your PC run very noticeably faster, but also smoother. My most recent FPS boost video got some totally fair criticism, so today I'll in detail tell you guys exactly what happens when you tweak the settings we're about to go over today, so that you can comfortably follow all the steps in today's video without worrying about something going wrong with your PC. To start this video off, I want to answer a common question I get, and that is, what what is input delay and why is it so important to lower it? Input delay is how long it takes from you clicking your mouse or keyboard buttons to you seeing those actions on your monitor. It can also be how long it takes for your audio to reach your headset, but more on that later. The shorter the delay here, the more responsive our game will feel. And doing fast builds and edits, as well as hitting shots, will be a lot easier the lower our input delay is. Input delay and FPS go hand in hand, as the best way by far to improve input delay is to directly improve your FPS. There are a few other tweaks you can also follow to get better input delay, so let's begin by doing those. Firstly, we want to make sure that our monitor is connected to the graphics card and not the motherboard. You see, if you connect your screen to the motherboard, you will not be utilizing the graphics processing power of the GPU, but you'll rather be using the integrated graphics of your CPU. For a game like Fortnite, we absolutely must ensure that our CPU doesn't get that heavy of a load. Now, having your monitor connected to the motherboard isn't generally dangerous at all for your components. It just comes with a hefty price tag of decreased performance. Secondly, when we turn on our PC, we want to create a restore point. To do this, simply click your Windows button and search for create a restore point. If this says protection off, like it does for me, click on configure and make sure turn on system protection is selected. Hit apply. Then when that is done, we want to head down to where it says create down here and click it. I recommend calling this before Marion TM's video. The reason we do this is so that if anything goes wrong and your game performs to a standard that is is not satisfying to you, you can always go back here and hit the system restore button, then next, then select before my NTM's video to get your settings back to before you even apply to the settings in today's video. Having a restore point does not decrease performance, so making one is highly recommended. Next up, I want to tell you guys about Hone. Hone is the sponsor of today's video, and I genuinely believe their software is heavily beneficial to anyone watching, as this app will in a super easy manner optimize your PC for gaming. To download Hone, simply go to the description below, click the link and hit the download button. Then when it's downloaded, go through the installation process by simply clicking next, then check the box that says that you accept the terms and privacy policy. Obviously, feel free to take whatever time you need to read through it before accepting and then hit accept and install. Then you'll have to sign in through your browser. This is simply done by clicking authenticate. If you don't already have an account, make one and you'll be good to go. When the program opens up, you'll see a long list of of optimizations. They also have detailed descriptions under each and every one, so you know exactly what you're doing when turning one on. For example, here you can see you have an option to turn on gaming optimizations. And slightly higher up, they have a setting called Disable Windows Power Throttling. That is a setting that is absolutely crucial to have disabled if you're playing on a laptop. In addition to this, they have game-specific tweaks. So if I head to the left-hand side here and go down to Game Optimizations and click in on Fortnite, I can activate Hone Performance, which will Will optimize my PC for optimal performance when playing FN. If any of the tweaks don't feel worth it for you, then you're just one click away from disabling them. The first time I tested Hone, my FPS not only increased by about 30%, but the performance also turned out more consistent, which makes playing tournaments, customs, and of course creative a lot easier. And the beauty of it all is that it is free to use, but with a slight caveat of only 10 optimizations. With premium, you get unlimited optimizations and no ads. Check it out in the description below or the pinned comment. The third thing we want to do is to disable some startup apps. To do this, right click on your taskbar and select task manager. Once task manager is opened, we want to go down to startup apps and see what apps we don't need in the background from when the PC is turned on. For me, I can comfortably disable CCX process, Creative Cloud, Steam, and Google Chrome. This is easily done by right clicking and selecting disable. Disabling these startup apps will make your PC not have as many processes running in the background, stealing away 
some of your computing power. Startup apps are super annoying as you just forget about them when you launch Fortnite and as a result you get slightly worse performance than what your PC actually allows for. So make sure to disable the apps you're not using as you'll not only see slight FPS benefits but you'll also see your boot times improve. On the topic of background apps, next up we want to uninstall some programs we no longer use. To do this, simply click your Windows button and search Control Panel. Then head into Uninstall a program and have a look if there's any programs you no longer use that you feel comfortable uninstalling. Now uninstalling a program in itself doesn't do that much, or most of the time anything at all for our performance. But if that program has some hidden processes that are running in the background whilst you're playing, you might see a slight boost in overall performance after uninstalling said app. So if you're not using a program anyways and aren't looking to use it anytime in the near future, I would highly recommend just hitting it with an uninstall, like I will right now by right clicking on Web Advisor for McAfee and selecting uninstall slash change. Next up, before we hop on Fortnite, you want to make sure your drivers are updated. Recently, both Nvidia and AMD driver updates have been insanely good. So nowadays, you can comfortably download the newest driver through simply clicking your Windows button and searching GeForce Experience if you have Nvidia and AMD software if you have an AMD graphics card. If you don't have a GeForce Experience or the AMD software, simply search for either names on Google and download them. In my case, since I have a Nvidia GPU, I'll open GeForce Experience. Head on over to Drivers and check for updates. Right now, my system is up to date. But if yours isn't, then simply do an express installation of the newest driver and you should be good to go. As this driver is the exact same one you'll be downloading as if you do it the old fashioned way. Or in other words, just not through GeForce. Force. On the AMD software, you'll be met with the place to update your drivers when you open the app right away. It will be on your right hand side and you can simply check for updates and download them if there is any. In the extremely rare cases that the newest Nvidia or AMD drivers makes your game crash more often than before, I would simply search on Google what are the best drivers for, for example, the RTX 3060 if you have a 3060, or what are the best drivers for the RX 7600 XT if you have the 7600, and so forth. Then simply download the driver people recommend. This is what I've done every year in the past. But recently, both Nvidia and AMD have been on top of their game with their driver updates, so I doubt this will be necessary for more than a handful of you. Alright, now we want to go ahead and launch Fortnite. Once the game is launched, make your way into the settings and change your rendering mode from Performance to DirectX 11. The reason we need to do this is to access some hidden settings that applies to Performance mode, but for some reason aren't visible with that very setting enabled. Once you're on a DirectX 11 and you restarted your game, make your way into the settings. Then we want to go all the way down so that we begin at the most important ones. Firstly, we want to make sure reporting performance stats is disabled. And then when we go one setting up, we see Nvidia Reflex Low Latency. If you have an AMD graphics card, you unfortunately won't see this. But right here, we need to set this to on plus boost. According to Nvidia's own testing, you can see input delay as much as 18 milliseconds lower with this set to on plus boost compared to if you have it off. Then when it comes to latency markers and whether or not you want to show FPS, that is totally subjective and doesn't affect performance. However, GPU crash debugging does, so make sure this is set to off. For all other settings, I strongly recommend low. If you're someone who lands at a big landing spot, then setting your view distance to medium or far will make it easier to see items laying on the ground compared to on near. But that's about it for the benefit of it as well. You do not see opponents further away, and I personally like to keep it at near. 3D resolution should be set to 100, although if your PC is incredibly bad, you can extract a decent amount of performance from simply setting it down to 75%. Motion blur should be off and what colorblind you use is totally up to you, but I really enjoy Triton Op 10 and 150% brightness, and can recommend that if you play on a monitor that doesn't have the best brightness from its stock settings. For the frame rate limit, I like to cap it at 360, as my hertz on my monitor are 362. V-Sync must be turned off, and your resolution should be what your native resolution on your screen is. The only reason I use 2560 is because I'm a content creator, and I enjoy that my content looks top tier when recording. I do not recommend it at all for performance. What you must have on though is full screen, and not windowed full screen. According to a study done by Nvidia, you get more than twice the system latency if you play on a 60Hz screen and windowed full screen compared to a 60Hz screen and full screen. So make sure you're an exclusive full screen. 
screen. When all these settings are applied, go back to performance mode, but don't click restart yet, as we also quickly have to turn off replays and energy saving in the game tab in the settings. To find this, head on over to the gear icon and scroll all the way down, then turn off all replay settings. Of course, unless you're someone who really enjoys looking at replays, although they are extremely broken right now. And also, make sure to turn off both the energy saving settings. Once all of these settings are applied, it's time to close Fortnite. When the game is closed, make your way into the Epic Games launcher. Go into the library, click on these three dots, then head on down to options. Right here, you'll see Save the World, High Res Textures, and DirectX 12 shaders. If you don't play Save the World, I recommend just uninstalling it by unchecking this box. High resolution textures are files that are required to play Fortnite more beautifully. And turning on high resolution textures on performance mode literally does nothing. It makes zero difference. So if you're like me and always play on performance mode, I recommend just uninstalling this too. And the very same can be said for DirectX 12 shaders, as these shaders aren't even possible to turn on on performance mode. So you might as well uninstall these too. Before hitting apply, just know that this uninstall might take a little bit of time depending on your PC and internet. So if you don't have a few minutes to spare, then I would recommend doing this when you have slightly better time. Moving on, we want to cut some processes. Luckily, a YouTuber by the name Chris Titus and his team have made an amazing program that easily limits how many processes you are running in the background. Before running a software, let's check how many processes I have by right-clicking on the taskbar and selecting Task Manager, and then heading into Performance. As you can see, I have well over 300 processes, which is a ton. So let's run Chris Titus's software and have a look at how many processes will end on after that. To run the software, right-click on your Windows icon down in the bottom left and go into where it says Terminal Admin. Then type in the following command. I'll leave it down in the description below so that you can copy it. Whilst you're down there, consider dropping a like. Then when the command is typed out, press Enter and a box like this will appear. When the box appears, make your way over to the Tweaks section. Under this tab, you'll see Recommended Selections for Desktop, Laptop and Minimal. I strongly recommend using the Recommended Desktop Selections if you're on a desktop PC and the Laptop Selections if you're on a laptop. Now, you might be wondering what some of these tweaks are, like oh no, shut up. This tweak makes it so that Windows does not pass on your data and diagnostics to Microsoft. It heavily limits your location services, something you probably won't be needing unless you're using Google Maps on your PC. And it also disables things like camera on user logon, ads via Bluetooth, and a few more security-oriented settings. On all of the other settings, you can hover over each and every one to see what the tweaks you're applying exactly does. When the tweaks are applied, simply press Run Tweaks. When they're done, you'll have to restart your device for the newly added tweaks to work. After restarting my PC, I went down to around 270 processes, which is still a lot, but it's 15% less than prior to using the program, which is a noticeable decrease. If you're on a desktop unlike me, then you'll probably see even better results in that you'll get a more substantial decrease. Now, tip number 10 is to set your system's power plan to ultimate performance. This tweak alone doesn't really do much, but we'll need this for tweak number 11, which is a total game changer and a tweak I've never seen anyone talk about on Fortnite YouTube before. To set your power plan to ultimate performance, press your Windows button and search for PowerShell. Then right click on it and run as administrator. When PowerShell is opened, paste the ultimate performance plan command that you can find in the video description and hit enter. When that is done, we want to search for power plan and select choose a power plan. Right here, we want to make sure that ultimate performance is selected. When that's selected, exit out of this window and you're ready for tweak number 11. Tweak number 11 will be to unpark your CPU cores. Parked CPU cores tends to only happen when the system doesn't need maximum processing power. Like for example, when you're searching around on Google or when the PC is more or less idle. However, for some reason, the technology behind CPU parking isn't flawless when it comes to delivering the best performance consistently. This is probably because it was made to be power efficient at the same time as performance efficient. So unparking your CPU cores will come with a performance increase, but will naturally also demand more power. So be aware of that. To unpark your CPU cores, go to the video description and go into the coder bag website. Once you're on here, you want to scroll all the way down to the very bottom and click download application. Once it's downloaded, drag the program onto your desktop and click extract here. Then open the program. Whilst you wait for the program to open, feel free to exit out of your Google tab. Then when it's finally opened, you simply want to take this slider all the way up to 100% and hit apply. Now all of your CPU cores are unparked and as a result, you'll be getting 
some increased performance. Next up, we gotta talk about peripheral latency. Peripheral latency is how much delay your mouse and keyboard have, and this varies from model to model. So I thought it would be a good idea to go over some of the mice with the best click latency and also some of the mice with the worst. You see, some mice have as bad latency as almost 40 ms, and using this equipment makes aiming specifically a lot harder compared to if you have a mouse with, say, 1 ms latency. In addition, if you're someone who plays at a time release, having a high click latency on your mouse will make becoming super fast at editing a lot harder than if you have a mouse with a lower click latency. So let's first go over the mice with the best click latency. Now, this entire study has been put together by Ali Safar, an enthusiast that comes across as highly trustworthy. He was also credited on Nvidia's website about how to reduce lag, and that is why I chose to confidently share his findings in today's video. The absolute best mouse in the world when it comes to click latency is the Asus ROG Chakram X. Unfortunately though, it has the same weight of an actual brick sitting at 127 grams. The reason it says minus 4.9 ms delay is because the formula followed for all mice in this post is latency minus 5 ms, so the real latency was 0.1 ms. But let's have a look at what some of the most popular mice for Fortnite, like the Lamso Atlantis Mini sits at. This one sits at minus 2.15 ms. The Logitech G Pro X Super Lite actually has 8 ms click latency, and the Razer Viper V2 comes in at 6.3 ms latency. Now, the question is, will you notice a difference of minus 2.15 ms and 8 ms like this Super Lite actually plays at? Now, if you didn't know that these mice had different latencies before playing with both, there is no way you would have noticed. But in comparison to some of the mice we're about to talk about now, you will definitely feel a difference in the latency. You see, gaming mice like the HyperX Pulsefire Raid has an impressively bad click latency of 28.6 ms. You also have models like the SteelSeries Kinsu V2 Pro, which has 25.2 ms click latency, and unfortunately for everyone who owns a Gigabyte Aorus M3, your mouse has a click latency of 37.3 ms, and quite honestly, if you ever want to become someone really good, playing with this mouse will hold you back, and you should upgrade it. I'll leave the full link to this entire study in the description below if you want to have a look. One thing we can do with our current gaming mice to improve the latency, according to Nvidia's very own study on input delay, is simply turning up the polling rate. Now, most gaming mice nowadays already come with a thousand hertz polling rate, but checking doesn't hurt anyone. First, begin by searching up the software of your gaming mice brand. For me, that is G-Hub, since I got the Logitech G Pro X Superlite. When I'm in here, I want to click in on my mouse and ensure that the report rate is set to a thousand. Not only will the mouse feel smoother, but we'll also get that slight performance increase from doing this. Another thing we must do if we have a wireless mouse is to make sure our dongle is on our desk and not connected to our desktop computer that is far away. You also want to make sure that the USB is connected to the hyperspeed sender of your mouse. Most gaming mice nowadays come with this big USB hub and utilizing the mouse as suggested by the brand behind it will in 99% of scenarios deliver less latency compared to if you just connect it via the USB. You can do this either by having a mouse bungee like I do or you can just tape the cord onto your desk so that the USB remains close to where your mouse is. Now when it comes to keyboards and latency there are two main things we look at. First the actual latency of a keyboard and secondly the actuation of a keyboard. Most gaming keyboard brands nowadays market their keyboards as great because they offer a low actuation and a low actuation does indeed matter and it will make a game like Fortnite feel more responsive. However the actual latency of a keyboard also plays a big role. A website I visit way too often by the name Ratings have actually tested 100 keyboards to see what the latencies of many popular keyboards are. Keyboards like the SteelSeries Apex Pro came out with a single key latency of 3.8 ms, which is insanely good. The Razer Huntsman Mini had a recorded latency of 3.9 ms, and the highly popular keyboard of the Wooting 60HE came out on an impressive 1.8 ms latency. Now, all these keyboard latencies are incredibly good, and again, no one would be able to feel the difference between 3.8 ms latency and 1.8 ms latency in itself. But if we start looking at something like the Ducky 1-2 Mini, where the latency is 15.8 ms, and given that the actuation on the keyboard is also terrible, you will start to notice the difference. Having a look if your keyboard is on this list and seeing what the latency is, is something I highly recommend. If you currently play on anything above 10 ms, I would advise considering upgrading your keyboard. If you have anything above 20 ms, then you're directly getting held back by your keyboard. So do with that information as you will. On the Apex Pro, you can also set the actuation to 0.1 millimeter, and the same is true for the Wooting 68G. On the Apex Pro, simply download the SteelSeries GG software, head into Engine, and click your keyboard. Then
then head into actuation and set the actuation to whatever you feel is right for you. Actuation simply explained is how far you have to click your key for the keystroke to register. Some people love having all keys at 0.1 millimeter and others prefer slightly higher actuation like one millimeter. If you do tasks on your PC like working. Moving on, we gotta talk about the best Nvidia control panel settings. Now, there's been a lot of controversy recently going over whether optimizing Nvidia 3D settings does anything at all, or potentially even decreases performance. Because of this, I ran a benchmark on Fortnite specifically to check whether it made a difference. And the findings were that I saw a 3% increase in average frame rate, no difference in the maximum frame rate as I did the benchmark capped at 360 FPS due to the fact that the vast majority of players play with the FPS capped anyways. A 5% increase in minimum frame rates, a 20% FPS increase in how bad my 1% lows were, and a staggering 48% FPS increase in how bad my 0.1% lows were. So needless to say, the 3D settings definitely does something, as having bad 1% lows can cause you to get eliminated in a game like Fortnite. So being able to increase the frames we drop to when we hit those percent lows can actually be a game changer. To put on the settings that I used, go to your desktop, right click, and for some, the Nvidia control panel will show up instantly. But for me, I have to click show more options and then Nvidia control panel. Then we want to go ahead and make our way down to the manage 3D settings tab and turn on the settings you see on my screen. Going down a little bit, you'll see that low latency mode is set to off. The reason for this is because of the fact that Fortnite has Nvidia reflex low latency built into the game and reflex overrides the Nvidia control panel low latency mode. So if you exclusively play Fortnite, then there's no point in having this on or set to ultra. However, if you play other games that doesn't offer Nvidia reflex low latency, then I highly recommend setting this to ultra. Monitor technology want to be set to fixed refresh and not G-Sync if your main goal is as low latency as possible. OpenGL compatibility needs to be on preferred performance, and the same can be said for power management mode. On preferred refresh rate, set it to the highest available. And lastly, on texture filtering, you want to make sure you have high performance enabled. Now, if you just want to pause the video for a second and apply the settings that I'm using, I'll slowly and surely just go up and down and show you all my settings. Feel free to pause the video and take whatever time you need to apply the same settings. Now, for my 19th tip, you want to disable visual effects. This right here is a tip I exclusively recommend to those of you who have the very bottom line of computers. I'm talking sub $500 desktop or laptop PCs. In order to do it, simply search for visual effects. Then, when this window appears, turn off both transparency effects and animation effects. The transparency effect makes some windows slightly transparent, so that they in general look way better. For instance, this is how my PC looks with and without this setting enabled on this settings page. The animation setting makes minimizing windows a lot more satisfying, as well as dragging apps around and fitting them however you'd like to your screen. This setting won't come with a massive performance increase on Fortnite. However, if you have a low-end PC, it will make using the computer more consistent and smooth. Since we're in here, we also want to turn off notifications. To do this, simply go down to notifications, and here you can either turn off notifications altogether, which I always do on my computers, or if you work or do school on your PC, you can turn off select notifications right down here. For instance, if OneDrive is something you will never need a notification from, simply just turn it off. Whilst we're in here, we also want to make sure to turn off tips and suggestions. This should be off by default, but just to make sure, make your way down to where it says additional settings, and make sure tips and suggestions are turned off. Now, since the last three tips weren't total game changers, let's talk about the most important setting on any gaming PC, namely turning on XMP for Intel-oriented motherboards or DOCP for AMD-oriented motherboards. XMP and DOCP are settings that allow your RAM to run at full speed. You see, stock out of the box, the majority of gaming PCs don't run on full RAM speed, whether you buy it pre-built or even if you build it yourself. Turning on XMP or DOCP is different depending on what brand motherboard you have. In order to find out what motherboard you have, press Windows plus R and search msinfo32. Then hit enter. When this box appears, you want to make your way down to baseboard manufacturer and see what that says. If it says MicroStar International, you have an MSI motherboard. If it says Gigabyte, you have a Gigabyte motherboard and so forth. Whatever it says, I recommend searching up on YouTube, either how to turn on XMP on MSI, or if you have an AMD oriented motherboard, meaning you have an AMD processor, search up how to turn on DOCP on MSI, if you have MSI of course. I will go over how to turn on XMP generally speaking, so chances are high you'll be able to understand how to turn it on from my how to right now, although we probably don't have the same motherboard.
Discord. Before we get into it though, I do need to note that not everyone will have the setting available, but if you have a mid to high end PC, chances are very high that you can extract a tremendous amount of performance from simply turning it on. To turn it on, begin by turning off your PC. Then boot it again, and when it boots, we need to spam delete F2 or F12 to get into the BIOS. If this doesn't work for you and you can't enter the BIOS by spamming one of these buttons, search up how to enter BIOS on an MSI motherboard, for example. Obviously, search for another motherboard if you have another. Then, when we've entered into the BIOS, we want to look for where it says XMP or DOCP. If we can see it straight away, simply change the setting from disabled to enabled. XMP can also be turned on sometimes from swapping to profile 1 to profile 2. And there are also many different names. You might also have to go into advanced mode to find it under something called DRAM Tweaker. When you've turned the setting on, simply press save and exit. For me, that can be done by clicking F10. Then when the system boots yet again, your RAM will be running at full speed. And not only will you have more FPS, but your system will more than likely also be way more consistent when it comes to playing something demanding. For example, an endgame in FNCS. Before moving on, I do want to note that the reason XMP is not enabled by default is because it is an overclock. One of the safest ones though. For a handful of systems, XMP will unfortunately not be stable. However, I've helped over 100 people tweaking their PCs and enabling XMP, and none of these have had any issues with the setting, emphasizing just how rare it is that XMP is more negative than positive. But with that said though, if you notice enormous FPS spikes after this video, the reason behind it will be XMP. But the beauty is that you can simply just turn it off again, and it will be fixed. Next up, I want to go over some simple yet effective tips you should follow not only for performance, but also PC longevity. Firstly, make sure your computer is not sitting on a carpet. This applies for both desktops and laptops. This is because when you place a computer on a carpet, more dust will undeniably get into the case. That can potentially cause overheating issues, and if the carpet is very thick, you'll also directly limit the ventilation of your desktop. Now, talking about dust, if you already have FPS inconsistencies, chances are high your radiator is filled with dust. A radiator is the most important component in any liquid-cooled computer, and if this is filled with dust, the cooling capabilities of your computer will tank, meaning you'll get FPS inconsistencies. Cleaning it can simply be done by turning the PC fully off and taking off the radiator and the connected fans. Then you want to use some compressed air, and potentially also a vacuum cleaner to get out all of the dust out of your radiator. If it's incredibly bad in terms of how much dust can be found in the radiator, I recommend watching a YouTube video on how to do a super thorough clean of it, as there are ways to clean your radiator using water and soap. But in order to do this, I strongly recommend watching a dedicated video. Since we're already on the topic of heat, I also need to touch on the thermal paste between your CPU and the heatsink. If your thermal paste is old or maybe not applied properly, you might want to consider repasting your CPU as this can cause major FPS inconsistencies. The thermal paste is there to improve the heat transfer between the CPU and the heatsink. So if this is applied to a high standard, you'll give yourself the best odds of achieving consistent performance. Whereas if the thermal paste is applied in a poor manner or it has started becoming flaky, it will do a poor job and your performance will be inconsistent. Now, a question a lot of people have is, does the quality of the thermal paste matter? And the answer is actually yes. When you go to buy a thermal paste, I strongly recommend investing into a high quality one. More often than not, this is unfortunately the more expensive alternative. But considering the difference between top tier thermal paste and low tier thermal paste usually isn't more than a few dollars, I'd say it's worthwhile. Now, as I know a lot of you guys watching are also laptop gamers, I strongly recommend getting a cooling pad for your laptop. Not only do these cooling pads come in at affordable price points of around $25 for great ones, but they also deliver a considerable performance increase without having to really do anything. If you can't get a cooling pad, I recommend just lifting your laptop up a little bit from the ground so that the fans underneath your device can get high quality airflow. And talking about laptops, you also of course don't want to use your laptop for gaming when it's not plugged into power. Laptops perform very noticeably worse when they're not plugged in. So making a small effort to plug your charger into the laptop and into the wall will instantly deliver much better performance. On the same topic, if you have the ability to connect your laptop to a monitor, testing has found that your system will be performing better, delivering better FPS and better frame times, meaning the game will feel more responsive and ultimately easier to play. Moving on, everyone knows to use an ethernet cable. Whether you play on a laptop or a desktop, an ethernet cable will always deliver much, much better internet performance for gaming than playing on Wi-Fi. The ping will be more consistent and also lower. 
lower. So if you're not currently using an ethernet cable, then I would highly recommend it. If you have the opportunity to, get one and start using it today, as not having one will directly hold you back in any online competitive game. Another question that commonly pops up when talking about ping and internet performance is whether your ethernet cable actually matters for ping. And I'm of course referring to the quality of the ethernet cable. The short answer is no. As long as your ethernet cable is of a relatively high quality, I'm talking cat5 and above, the latency you will feel with that cable and any cable more expensive will be identical. On more of a technical level, you must ensure that you're using the correct RAM slots. Depending on what motherboard you have and how many RAM sticks you have, where the RAM should be placed could potentially be different. However, for the vast majority of motherboards, you want to utilize RAM slots 2 and 4. What a lot of people don't know is also that XMP often isn't available if you use RAM slots 1 and 3. If you have two RAM sticks and use slot 1 and 2, you won't be getting the best performance from your RAM due to the fact that acquiring data from the processor will take longer, given that only one channel will acquire signals from your CPU, compared to two channels gathering information at the same time if you use slots 2 and 4 or 1 and 3. Now, next up, I want to quickly talk about something quite polarizing, and that is whether or not USB ports matter for latency. Is a USB port 3.0 or 3.1 better than a USB 2.0 when it comes to the input delay of your mouse, keyboard, headset, or controller? Well, it generally shouldn't matter at all. There shouldn't be any difference whatsoever. However, a YouTuber that is highly trustworthy by the name Rocket Science actually found that using his USB 3.1 ports for his controller, he was able to decrease his input latency. So if you have USB 3.1 ports, I recommend just using them. Although theoretically, there shouldn't even be an ounce of a difference. What does make more than an ounce of a difference though, is using a display port for your monitor over an HDMI cable. Display ports have less latency than HDMI ports and will make your game instantly feel more responsive. Aiming, building, and editing should become slightly easier as soon as you make the change. And the older your HDMI cable is, the truer this statement is too. I also recommend getting a relatively solid DisplayPort cable if you're looking to make this change in the future. On a totally different topic, I'm going to talk about something for the enthusiasts watching, and that is getting a custom water cooling loop. Now, getting a custom water cooling loop demands quite a bit of work, especially the first time you do it. But in my opinion, it's something anyone can easily do and get the benefits of if you're patient enough and do a decent bit of research. For a game like Fortnite that is impressively demanding, especially on the CPU, having a custom water cooling loop that is able to cool your system, both CPU and GPU, better than any AIO or air coolers ever will, it will actually come with an impressive improvement in consistency. And as a result, the feel of the game will be way better, resulting in an easier game to play and perform in. If you're someone who almost plays at the top, I would strongly recommend, if you believe in your own abilities to play professionally in the future, to consider investing in a water cooling loop, although it is by no means a cheap upgrade. The beauty of having a water cooling loop in place is that you know you'll have an unfair advantage over so to say everyone in your end games because of just how good your cooling is. Your PC will be able to stay cool and consistently perform even when it's ultra stacked and your PC runs at full extended loads. Talking about the slightly more advanced tips, I also recommend repasting your GPU every two and a half to three years. Just like with the CPU, there is a thermal paste on your GPU, and this thermal paste tends to get flaky and unoptimal after around the two and a half year mark. Repasting any GPU is super simple to do, and tutorials going over it can be found all over YouTube. The beauty of repasting the GPU is that when your graphics card runs at lower temps, it can maintain higher clock speeds for longer, resulting in lower latency. What about motherboards. Do they matter for latency? Well, the motherboard itself will not be causing a delay. However, low-end motherboards usually don't offer support for powerful components like RAM with high speeds. But of course, as long as you know that your motherboard can handle your components to their full potential, you'll be good to go. What about the power supply? Does that make a difference in input delay? Again, not really, as long as it's able to power all your components. However, there have been stories from individuals who claim that getting a new PSU made their input delay somehow a lot better. These stories cannot theoretically be true, as long as the PSU has been good enough to run the components of the PC. But maybe there is an exception to this rule as well. Moving on to tip 40, I would recommend considering overclocking your CPU. A lot of people think overclocking is this one-way ticket to destroying your computer, or that it's insanely hard. But in reality,
reality, neither is true. Now, there are two things that are musts if you want to overclock. Firstly, it is absolutely crucial that your cooling system is top tier. And secondly, that you're someone who knows what they're generally doing when it comes to PCs. Overclocking is also done in BIOS, and earlier in this video, I went over how to find your motherboard brand. So if you want to look into overclocking, I would recommend searching up how to overclock my CPU on an MSI motherboard, for example. Do with this information as you will. Next up, we need to make sure that our performance options are set to programs. To do this, simply click your Windows button and search performance. When adjust the appearance and performance of Windows appears, click it and head into advanced. Here you can see it says adjust for best performance of either programs or background services. Make sure programs are selected. Now, next up, I want to talk about adjusting your CPU's fan speeds from BIOS. Now, most of the time, the automatic fan speeds on your system will be more than good enough. However, in some scenarios, manually setting your fan speeds to a higher RPM will result in lower temps and ultimately more consistent performance. So if you notice that your fans are running slowly or you face any other issues with your fans, I recommend looking into a dedicated video on the matter. On a totally different matter, monitors are incredibly important and getting a solid one will actually make it feel like your input delay goes down by a great amount. As objective as I can be, I gotta say the best monitor on the market right now is the Alienware AW2725DF, but this one is insanely expensive, so I can't comfortably recommend it to everyone. But when looking for a monitor, make sure you look at the hertz, the response time, and what kind of screen it is. Is it OLED, mini LED, IPS, or something totally different? All of these specifications matters when it comes to the feel of the monitor. So do your research, find out what matters to you, and find the one that fits within your budget when you're looking to upgrade. And I'm sure you'll hit a home run. The people who don't hit home runs are the people who use their PC's aux input for their headsets. Now, if your headset has the option to get connected via USB, like the HyperX Cloud headsets or the Logitech G Pro headsets, do that instead of connecting directly to the aux to lower the delay between the sound is sent from your system and until it reaches your headset. Another simple thing you can do is have a look through your downloads to see if there's anything you no longer use that you can delete for some extra space. This won't directly give you any additional performance. However, it will feel good to delete some old, unused apps. On the same note, make sure your recycle bin is empty. Now, deleting percent temp percent files is what we want to do next. Simply search percent temp percent, press Ctrl A, and delete. Nowadays, you won't get any performance increase at all from this. But if you've never done it before, you'll probably have well over one gigabyte just laying here for absolutely no reason. And clearing up a gigabyte here and there, although not really doing anything for performance, is a good feeling for the mind and soul. Now, getting close to the end of today's video, I want to give you guys a bit of a gem when it comes to performance, and that is getting an off-board network interface card. Off-board NICs are, generally speaking, performing better than on-board NICs. This is because of motherboards, especially in the lower to mid-price range, sometimes cheap out on a few things, and unfortunately, the victim of this can be your NIC. Obviously, before upgrading, make sure that you actually have a low tier NIC, and not a good one. Some motherboards actually come with impressively good NICs, although they are relatively cheap. The second to last thing we want to do today is updating our chipset drivers. I recommend searching up on YouTube how to update your chipset drivers on AMD if you have AMD and Intel if you have Intel. It's surprisingly easy and can sometimes come with improved performance and stability. Lastly, if your PC is incredibly old and you've downloaded hundreds of different games, apps, and visited some sketchy sites over your time with it, I honestly would consider just doing a full factory reset. Full factory resetting your computer can often come with some incredible performance benefits, especially on old systems. So if my previous words were some that could describe you, then I'd recommend going down that route. Guys, thanks for watching. Check out Tone for easy optimizations in the description below. And other than that, have an amazing day.